Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It's a storefront between 7th and 8th Avenue on 30th Street, an old fur factory. The sign on the window says simply 257. Next to that, it says Antonio Olivieri Center for Homeless Women. There's an orange UP with an arrow pointing upward next to that. Not much. The center is and was the only drop-in center for homeless women when it opened in 1981, and it remains the only drop-in center that solely serves women. It is a safe haven for women who are severely and persistently mentally ill. The center is named for Antonio Olivieri, a champion of the less fortunate, a state assemblyman, a city council member, my boss, and my friend. Here to talk about the work of the Olivieri Center is Frederick Schack, the executive director of the center's parent organization. Urban Pathways is a nonprofit, community-based human services agency that responds to the problems of the homeless. Prior to joining Urban Pathways, Mr. Schack spent 14 years at Help USA, his last position as senior vice president of client services and public policy. And joining me also is an old dear friend who served with me as staff to then council member Antonio Olivieri, Mary McCartney. Mary is the corporate communications director at Con Ed and sits on the board of Urban Pathways. Prior to Con Ed, Mary worked at the New York City Transit Authority and other government agencies. Welcome, Mary. Welcome, Fred. Glad to be here. Thank you. Both of you, Fred in particular, homeless are in the news. You've got the Coalition for the Homeless Report. You've got reports in the media, the Daily News headline, going ranks of homeless filling city shelters, says a scathing report. Talk a little bit about the, the state of homeless and the homelessness in New York and what's changed in the last 30 years, in fact. Well, I think it's interesting to understand that homelessness has been a part of this country's fabric uh, since the very beginning. Um, here in New York City, over the last 30 years, I think we've made a significant amount of progress as it relates to the problem. Um, I think that we are investing in very much wiser ways in terms of uh, looking at approaches that have uh, historically not been available to working with those individuals who are chronically homeless. And those are the individuals that we serve at the Olivieri Center. And when you Olivier. talk about chronically homeless, who are these folks? Who are these women? Describe them. I know they're all unique individuals, but who are they? Generally, they're individuals who are seriously, persistently mentally ill. Um, they're individuals who have spent a significant amount of time living on the streets of the city um, or in the transportation hubs or in the subways. Um, there are folks who have maybe used the shelter periodically, but who would prefer um, the freedom and the safety, as they see it, of being on the street. Um, the approach at the Olivieri Center is a very low threshold, low demand approach. Um, we basically provide a myriad of services to um, those individuals. Uh, medical services, uh, we provide meals, uh, we provide opportunities for them to get access to public benefits. For those individuals who are eligible for SSI, um, we'll work with them to ensure that they are able to make their applications and to receive some income. But ultimately, our objective is to work with them to find uh, stable and affordable housing. How has it changed? over the last 30 years and let's say before you answer that let's you know we're referencing this 30 years ago well almost exactly 30 years ago Mary McCartney as a staff member to Antonio Olivieri went out and did really one of the first studies of shopping bag ladies the homeless and it was then written up by the legendary uh, columnist Murray Kempton and then it sort of took off. Talk about what led you to, to the study and its impacts. It's, uh, it's interesting to hear you refer to uh, homeless women as shopping bag ladies, Doug. You're right. At the time, that is, that is how they were described, how we all described them. And really, very little was known 
um, about women who were living on the street. Everybody thought of it really as, as a problem, you know, with men on the Bowery, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that uh, you know, that, that kind of scenario. So when we started, um, started looking at the issue, and, and as you recall, Tony was very interested. He was a freshman city councilman mm -hmm. um, and was very interested in um, issues, uh, you know, social service issues. You know, later went on to do a lot of work with yourself and Bill Castro on adult home industry and things like that. So he, you know, we were we were intrigued and and a little uncertain as to what we were going to find. Mm -hmm. um, and you're absolutely right. The the, the report really reflected a um, at the time sort of sadly brief review of the uh, resources that were available to these women. Um, there was a women's shelter that was actually quite well run for what it was at the time. But um, you know, we saw the need for just what Fred described, a drop-in center, um, because you have, to, you have to gain the trust and confidence of these women for them to even get to the point where they would be willing to accept services, and that's how the Olivieri Center got started. Talk about, I remember you coming back to the office after, I think, your first visit in, into the, where these folks lived. Describe your feelings and what you saw. Well, we, we, I mean, there were several, uh, um, several site visits that you, you, know, you went to, uh, as Fred said, a lot of times the transportation centers, you know, where people would feel, um, would feel comfortable. And as you correctly pointed out, the Murray Kempton piece really gave the story's legs, mm -hmm. as you would say. I mean, he, he, he described uh, uh, this, the situation with much more poetry than the report did and, and much more insight. As, um, as did, did, you know, as did you, in fact. Well, it, it, the, the, the piece that, uh, that Murray Kempton wrote um, garnered a lot more press, and so we had right. uh, a couple of incidents where some TV reporters, for instance... Tell the story. Uh, you were furious. <laughs> yeah, came out, and we, we were working with a, a woman, I believe it was in Brooklyn, who lived in an abandoned, abandoned home on the top floor, you know, had 20 or 30 cats with everything that you can imagine um, uh, that meant, and she carried buckets of water upstairs every day for herself and for her cats. And uh, we had asked her if she um, uh, would mind speaking to a reporter. Um, she said no. I kind of know, I look back on that, I'm a little embarrassed. I kind of know now that she probably was not in any kind of shape to make that kind of a decision. But, you know, it was one of those decisions you make that more press is going to help get this story right, out even right, further. Right. And, and um, so uh, a, a reporter from one of the TV stations showed up and, and we were describing the situation. And he, he uh, went upstairs, I recall his cameraman saying, you know, uh, I haven't seen anything like this since a battle zone, um, you know, with, with the, the, the terrible conditions she was living, uh, living in. And the reporter, we get to the top, and she described how she would go downstairs and get water every day. And the reporter said to, to me, well, we didn't get that on camera. Do you think she'd mind doing it again? Oh, my. And we said, okay, no. <laughs> and you, came, yeah. you were totally furious. The answer to that is no. Nonetheless, uh, it was a, a very sure. effective piece right. um, on... Uh, on and, the news, and, and things sort of took off. Then the press became engaged in this, and there was more information. And, and to their credit, Mayor Koch, this was Mayor Koch's right, first right. term, um, his social service uh, commissioners and, um, you know, were, were kind, of, you know, kind of like, well, gee, we don't know that much about this ourselves. Right. So, uh, yeah, we were really in a period of, of real ignorance. Yeah, and, yeah. and Fred, in, in, in your introductory comments, you talked about, you know, the multiplicity of problems, et cetera, and sort of the long learning curve that we've had. How has the homeless population changed over the years and has it and what is it in terms of the problem and what is it in terms of the solution? Well, I, I think it, you know, it varies with different populations. With homeless women, um, single women, generally you're dealing with a situation where there's a mental illness uh, that interferes with their ability to function. Um, and there's also the issue of poverty. Um, you put those two things together and you find yourself in a situation where you don't have the resources to get the treatment and the support that you need and you can't afford that. How do they become homeless in the first place? Um, most people find themselves in situations where they're either um, dislocated uh, because of conflict with family or friends, mm -hmm. um, or they don't have the income, the resources to be able to afford housing. Um, people um, generally are, um, you know, they'll find themselves in a period of hospitalization, mm -hmm. they'll leave the hospital, they'll live with friends temp um, temporarily, uh, that welcome will wear itself out and they'll find themselves on the street. And where have they gone institutionally before they come to you 
or while they're coming to you? Uh, well, many of our clients use the medical facilities, uh, the inpatient uh, psychiatric facilities uh, for very brief periods, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the primary medical facilities as well um, for periods to treat um, health conditions that they have. Um, and they, again, they live with family and friends um, for as long as they can possibly endure that um, or their family and friends can provide them support. And the reality is that many of our clients have limited resources. Um, so they're, you know, they're relying on support systems that um, really don't have space and or the financial resources to provide them with the assistance that they need. And I walk in and I am, uh, you know, a woman who is in need of, of, of what you provide. Mm -hmm. And wh what happens? What what goes on? She walks in and what? Well, the first thing we want to do is to make sure that you are comfortable. Um, it's creating trust. Uh, it's finding out from the client's perspective, what do you need? What would you like for us to do for you? In some cases, it's simply a meal. Um, they, don't, they don't want to make a commitment for long-term services. They're not interested in going through a psychiatric evaluation. Um, they want something to eat and a warm place to stay, mm -hmm. and we'll provide that. Um, we'll continue to interact with them, to attempt to engage them. Them to talk further about what we can do to mm -hmm. provide assistance and hopefully over over a period of time uh, get them to a point where they're willing to accept um, the more substantial services that we have available. So you have a regular quote unquote clientele as well as you know people who just drop in right. and then drop back out? Right. We have individuals that we um, refer to as being our case managed clients. And they're clients who have engaged in a relationship with a, um, a professional staff member. Um, they've identified a service plan that they're interested in working on, and we work with them to assist them in getting those service needs met. And generally, that means uh, helping them to find permanent housing and to move towards a, a point where they'll be able to access permanent housing. Mm -hmm. And we also have clients who um, are drop-in clients. They, they will come in for a meal, they'll come in for a warm place, they'll come in for medical attention, mm -hmm. um, they'll come in for a referral, and they, get um, and they get that, and they'll go back out. Okay. Um, it's really, I think, what Fred's describing, which is you know one of the things that Urban Pathways does so successfully, um, is describing a what we call the, the continuum, continuum of care, care. Okay. Um, which is from outreach, you know, uh, not even waiting for somebody to come to us, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, uh, uh, outreach, and then, you know, kind of garnering trust and, and, and confidence um, at a drop-in center, and then, as Fred described, kind of working with them, and it can take quite some time right. until, uh, you know, uh, uh, with our many successful s cases, um, right. you know, getting getting people to kind of the optimum of their where they're going to be, you know, and, and um, it doesn't mean that, that there aren't people, I think we all know, that are going to need care for the rest of their right. lives. Um, and I, you know, think everybody agrees that, you know, you want it, that done humanely and, and make that person comfortable and working to the best of their abilities. And that's the sort of thing that, uh, that Urban Pathways excels at. Okay, let's talk about Urban Pathways. When did it happen? What does it do? The Olivieri Center is a piece of those activities. And you're on, you're on the board, Mary. So talk about, you know, the directions of where you've been and where you going and where you'd like to be, and you jump in, Fred. I will. Well, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a terrific organization. It's, it's when you, you know, when people talk about, well, you know, something should be done for the homeless or about the homeless or, um, you know, Urban Pathways is, is And they, an they've been around almost, uh, almost as long as yeah. your report, in fact. Yeah, 30, 30 yeah, years. I just feel, feel older by the second. Right, I keep uh, mentioning that. I'm <laughs> st you know. in, in my great youth, right? right. Uh, we're actually uh, we're actually celebrating our 30th year that's anniversary right. okay. um, this year. Um, actually, it was last year. Uh, but we provide a um, a number of services, and and generally we're working with those individuals that are the most chronic um, homeless mm -hmm. population. Um, individuals who spend years on the street. Um, individuals who have opted out of the traditional service systems that have been available mm -hmm. through the city. And let me say that in New York City um, is 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 a wonderful place in in terms of uh, its commitment to addressing this problem. Um, we invest over $700 million a year um, in the agency that is responsible and, for dealing with homeless families and homeless individuals. That, and, and that generally has been the case, and particularly, I, I, I would say, in the Bloomberg administration, the concern with issues of poverty and homelessness. I know Linda Gibbs is you know, a dedicated public treasure, in fact. Mm -hmm. But what, where, do you, where do you get your wherewithal. What is what is Urban Pathways? It's a nonprofit. Who who funds it? 
Who do you have contracts with? The, the, the facility, the Olivieri Center, uh, as I found that is a secure center, which was wonderful. I went in, mm -hmm. th in my ignorance, and wanted to just see Fred, you know, and you have not to be there, but I was informed that it was a secure facility, and I couldn't gain entry, and I could only gain entry through the Department of Homeless Services. And as I told you, I spoke to uh, Steve Grimaldi of your office, and he was sort of apologizing for the rules. I said, no, 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 I get it. You want to keep me out for my safety as well as the safety of the uh, so it's it's under D, uh, DHS just talk about you know the organization itself Mary a little bit well we have we have a, a number I, I would sort of defer to, to Fred for, for Fred. The, the the best insight but we have a number of, of really terrific um, uh, facilities um, reflecting the continuum of care so it, it's really an understanding that it you know it takes multiple solutions to solve the problem. Okay. Um, so we do street outreach. Um, we are um, we have outreach workers who are responsible for traveling uh, the city um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we're responsible for a section of Manhattan, and we attempt to engage individuals on the street. Um, again, trying to encourage them to come indoors for services. Who works for you? Talk about the organization. There's you. It's about 200 employees. Okay. Um, case, and they do case what? Case managers, uh, social workers, clinicians, um, security staff, uh, maintenance staff, clerical staff. Uh, we have our central offices on uh, 8th Avenue um, and between 38th and 39th Street. We operate uh, about 14 programs here in Manhattan. We're in the process now of developing programs in Brooklyn. And we're developing a new residential program um, in the Bronx uh, that uh, we should hold hopefully begin construction on in August. Talk about the housing. Housing seems to be a sine qua non for the, if not the elimination, at least the amelioration of the problem or the mitigation of the problem. Housing seems to be central. You folks just got a Deutsche Bank grant to build 200 units of yeah, affordable housing? Yeah, part of what we're interested in doing is really working towards long-term solutions. And you're absolutely right, Doug. Uh, housing is central to solving this problem. And, you know, the reality is that there are a significant number of people who are mentally ill and who are substance abusers and who are poor, but they're housed. Um, the difference with this population is that they have those issues and they are without housing. Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent that we can provide safe, affordable housing, for this population, they will no longer be homeless. They, they may still have other issues right. that we need to work with them around right. resolving, but they won't be homeless. So I, I think what Fred just said is the key also that it's not just the apartment or it's right. not just the house. Right. Um, and that I think really 30 years ago there was a sense like, oh gee, if we just get the uh, you know, housed, right. they just get these people, we get these people in housing, right. everything will be hunky dory. Right. Or, you know? or just provide services. If we can fix the individual, right. um, then their housing problem will go away. And that's right. not a reality. I mean, housing is just not affordable. Um, so if you're if you're poor and you have very limited resources um, and you have a substance abuse problem or you're mentally ill, um, you're going to find yourself extremely vulnerable. Given the effort of city agencies to, to, to deal with the problem, the fact that it is still, it's still burgeoning and still very serious, what's going on? What, what, what's generating this? And what, what ought to be the public response? Well, I think we have to, you know, it's, it's just interesting. It, it's not just a local problem. It's a national problem. Um, and it's not only, as we talked not, about earlier, it's not only urban problem, It's not only urban. It's in the rural communities as well. Um, there really has to be a, a full governmental response um, on, the, on the federal government side, on the state government, and on the city government. The city has done a wonderful job in terms of its commitment to providing resources and time and attention to this issue. Um, and they've also um, entered into new strategies that I think are going to be extremely successful in working with those individuals who have historically opted out mm -hmm. of the traditional shelter system. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little bit about those um, uh, a little later. But ultimately, you, you have to figure out ways to get federal commitment to making housing affordable. Yeah, but that, um, I mean, the, the, the feds have gutted essentially the Section and, 8 and program. They've capped it. It's that's a large part of the problem. Um, unless you can create ways of making housing affordable and on a national scale, um, you're always going to have a significant number of people who will find themselves homeless. Any, any of the candidates at all even alluding to this, this problem? National candidates? Not I, so much I, that the you would notice. Yeah, no, uh, no, I mean, I don't no. think those it, are the really issues. Is. You're being it's, politic, yeah, I, okay? Yeah, but it really, it really hasn't been on on sort of the national agenda, okay. um, and it needs to be. What um, about the state? On the state level, I, I think there was. We actually, I, I met with Spitzer along with some other advocates um, about. Uh, 
a month and a half ago, and we were fairly optimistic that he was going to um, commit uh, both resources and energy um, to this to this issue, and we're hoping that we'll get the same thing from Patterson. Um, what are you looking for? Well, we're, we're looking for a continued investment in um, in supportive housing development. Uh, supportive housing is, is basically the housing stock that's affordable with the services that are associated with that so that the clients who are there um, can get their service needs met right. in a safe and affordable environment. Um, so an expansion of that model I think is critical to working with this population, the chronically homeless. In terms of just general affordability, um, you know, uh, a, a Full, a full commitment on the Section 8 program, right. the expansion of that, right. um, a commitment on there's a, a housing trust fund that is available here in New York State, um, an expansion of that, and a continued um, direct, a continued direction of the Bloomberg administration in terms of its uh, new housing market uh, investment. Okay, so I increase your, what's, what's your annual budget? About $10 million. Okay, I give you $2 million. Unrestricted. You're smiling already, Absolutely. and it's not even real money. Absolutely. <laughs> what, where do you spend that money? What are your priorities as an institution, and why? Solutions to chronic homelessness is in housing. Um, so okay. creating housing with services. Um, okay. That's the direction that we're going. And this model, I mean, out of all the models that have been played with, and there have been literally dozens over the last couple of decades, this is the one that works, the housing with the supportive housing services. Housing with services and a low threshold housing model. I mean, we've had housing Meaning with services. Meaning, I don't. Well, low threshold. Um, historically, in order to access the housing stock that was available, a client would have to make a commitment around their sobriety or around their mental health treatment um, as a precondition. So right. you can't get the housing unless you're going to commit to your sobriety, unless you're going to enter into psychiatric treatment right. and take your medication. Um, that worked for a significant number of people. However, there were last year about 3,700 people living on the street in January. This year, about 3,200, 3,300 mm -hmm. people living on the street in January. Those are individuals who basically opted out. And they've said, you know what? We're not willing to do that. We're not able to do that um, as a condition for getting housing. The low threshold models basically say, what we're going to do is we're going to put the housing purse. We're going to say to you, if you're willing to come in off the street, we'll bring you in. We'll provide you with a place to live, and we'll deal with the services as a secondary issue as opposed to a primary issue. So it's no longer a barrier to access to housing. Okay. What we're finding, we opened our first safe haven um, in July. Um, there was an individual who was living in the Flatiron District here in the city, um, had been on the street for 15 years. That person came into that facility in July as a result of that kind of outreach, basically saying, look, you don't have to stop drinking. Um, you don't have to go into treatment. Uh, we just want you off the street. We want you to be safe. They mm. said, you know, I don't, I don't really believe that. Uh, they came, they visited the location. They decided that they would stay. They've been there um, since July. Um, and now that individual is working on issues of sobriety. And that person's also interested in finding his own apartment. So the housing isn't the only thing, but it certainly is the, pr the primary thing. Go ahead, Mary. In, in a way, Fred, uh, you know, you think about how, how hard everybody worked to get rid of the SROs, the mm -hmm. single room occupancy hotels right. back in the 70s and 80s. Right. Right. And we thought that that was, I mean, there were many, many problems. Right. But in, in a certain sense, mm -hmm. you know, I think people have uh, uh, seen that there is a value in that kind of low threshold, get in out of the rain. Right. And, and we'll, right. yeah, let's, let's get you in and safe and fed and, and right. work from there. Yeah, without, some without, some of the, go ahead. Yeah, without abandoning um, the idea that they still need um, the service intervention. Yes. So you, you want to make sure that that's available, but you don't want to make it a, you don't want to make service acceptance a condition okay. of getting the house. Okay. Let's clarify some terms. You use the term safe haven. Is, is that a technical, that, 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 that seems to have a technical yeah, meaning. It's, it's a low threshold housing model. It's a residential model. Right. Um, generally, it's transitional in nature, um, but a person can stay for as long as okay. they need that level of care. Okay. Um, and it's one that doesn't require, as a, con a precondition, a that. commitment to security. Okay. And, it, and it, it doesn't necessarily refer to security in a physical sense of, of, of the, no, of no, the, it doesn't. Of the um, apartment. But it does say that you know, if, you are, if you continue to drink or to use drugs, if you are not committed to your mental health, um, you would still have a place to stay. Okay. And I think as Fred said, the, the important thing is that the, the majority of, of, uh, of clients, mm -hmm. you know, when they come in, do sort of immediately, that is working on sobriety and those issues. Absolutely. This is for, 
you know that 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 last mile. Yeah. Okay. Uh, those 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 people, the the hardcore that are really hard to get. And you know, how do you reach them? Okay. As, as Fred said, there's no one way. Right. And the question that you ask yourself: Would, would you prefer? Would right. we prefer to have that person on the street? Right. Or would we prefer right. to have them indoors? Right. And you know, it's a, it's a real simple response. The answer is we much prefer to have them off the street, indoors, even if they don't change their behavior. Okay. You got about a minute and a half. A new mayor comes in in January 2010. You're his ad advisor on homeless policy, or her. Mm -hmm. What 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 are our priorities? What are our what's our agenda? I know housing, but yeah, well, it's it's the housing has to be um, sort of the how much so, um, we probably could use another four to five thousand units. Okay, at how thousand. what cost per unit? It's actually cheaper than keeping someone on the street. Um, I, you know, I would the think so. The, the reality is that the, the cost of maintaining someone on the street involves police activity. It involves emergency room visits, um, detox visits, uh, short-term um, psychiatric placements, uh, things of that nature. And what we found is with um, supportive housing, their use of those other systems decreases significantly so that the cost of maintaining them in housing is significantly less. How do you convince the, you know, the political establishment and the folks out there there, that that's the case, that this is an investment that is worth it, not only in terms of, you know, humaneness, but also in terms of, you know, raw bottom line economics. I, I think just the way that Fred, ha I mean, Fred's on, uh, you know, an advocacy committees, uh, a number of governmental uh, committees, I think, you know, by continuing to educate and, and to appreciate that there are, there are uh, you know, different demands for these dollars, but that, uh, you know, how effective dollars going into housing can be for an organization I mean, like you're us. probably an optimistic guy by nature, otherwise you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Are you optimistic that there is a, you know, both the will and the means to deal with this in the next several years? I think that there is the will, and I, but I don't believe that there's a means if we're talking about from the city's perspective. Okay. Um, it can't be done just okay. with local dollars. It, okay. it really does need a commitment on the part of all branches of government. So okay. the, the state government really has to do its share. The federal government absolutely has to do its share because, again, it's not just a local problem. It's not a New York City problem. It's a national problem, okay. um, and it's rooted in housing affordability and a real commitment and investment in services for those individuals who can't access those services. Excellent. Thank you. Go, go ahead. I just wanted to say for your listeners, um, uh, that's a macro uh, level, level, but we are, are always looking for people to help out with donations and um, that we have a wonderful program, Share Your Lunch, and people can visit our website, www.urbanpathways.org for more information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your appearance and Thank great you to see you. I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.